Hi there, welcome to the second interview of Software Architecture and Stream, OP edition, The English Evening. My guest is Aino, and we will talk about retrospective. But because uh, be before we started, um, I want to tell you how to ask your questions. You have the YouTube, YouTube chat and Twitch chat as usual, but the guys joining from the um, conference platform can ask their questions by sending me a private message. Um, so you have the chance to send questions, which will be answered right in this interview. So, hi, Aino. I'm very pleased to meet you here. Um, could you introduce yourself a bit? Sure, I can. And thank you for inviting me, Lisa. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Aino Kori. I live in Denmark. I am actually Danish. And uh, I've just written a book about uh, retrospectives, anti-patterns, as you can see the front page and behind me. I am originally um, software Uh, developer, I've, I've taken, I, oh, I'm tired. I took a PhD in computer science 20 years ago, but that was focusing on theoretical, technical issues. But in the 20 years since then, I've been moving more and more towards communication and people and processes and things like that. I really like to try to make people communicate. And I've been facilitating retrospectives for 15 years. And I've made all the mistakes that you can possibly make when facilitating retrospectives. And that's why I decided to write a book about it. So maybe other people wouldn't make the same mistakes. Or at least if they did, they could feel comfortable that I made the same mistake. <laughs> okay. Um, so why do you think retrospectives are important? And maybe you should um, explain retrospectives in, um, in a short way that everyone knows what it is. Yeah. So a retrospective is a structured meeting for a team where you look back at what has happened and you share what you thought about the things that happened and you learn about what has happened and then you are able to change the way that you work together so that you can improve little by little. So there's the, the famous book by Diana Larson and Esther Darby, which is called Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great. And the subtitle um, invites you to think that even if you're a good team, you can become even better if you have retrospectives. And I think it's really important to have these retrospectives in order to improve the way that you're working. And even though I sometimes meet a team that says, we work fantastically together, we do everything right. We have the wonderful code reviews and we have continuous integration and, and we love to be together. We have such a good teamwork. You can always still improve. It's like if you were a skier, even professional skiers, they're always trying to improve. They're just trying to sort of improve a little bit here and a little bit there. And that's what you're doing with retrospectives. You have them continuously, maybe every second week, every third week, every month, depending on how often you want to have them. And every time you try to turn a little handle or you push a little button and you get a little bit better all the time. So the most benefit you can take out of a retrospective is get, getting better every time to summarize this uh, answer. Okay. Um, and what can each of us do to make our retrospectives more efficient or more, more beneficial um, for each other? Yeah, so the whole book that I've written is aimed at retrospective facilitators. For every retrospective, there's a facilitator. There's somebody who made the agenda, who is introducing the activities, who is trying to lead the discussion so not to a specific topic, but lead it so that the whole team decides together where should we go and lead it so that we actually get to finalize discussions and learn from them and get action points. But the people who are entering retrospectives can do something themselves. And that is the ma majority of the people, of course. Uh, most of us are just attending retrospectives. But one thing that's very important when you're attending a retrospective is to have the right mindset. And the right mindset is that this is not a naming and blaming game. What you want to do when you are in a retrospective is that you want to share what has happened so that everybody learns from each other about what happened. That's a very powerful part of the retrospective, but also that you gain insights together. You try to learn from this and you figure out why did this, why did this thing happen? What caused this thing to happen? Both the negative and the positive things. And the point is that if you 
enter the retrospective thinking, I want to find the scapegoat, I want to figure out who to blame, then people will be in opposition. They'll be trying to protect themselves because they know that perhaps they were the culprit this time, maybe they'll be the scapegoat and that'll feel bad. So if you can enter the retrospective thinking that everybody did the best they could at the time. Noam Kurth was the first one to, wrote, to write about project retrospectives and he had this prime directive that basically says everybody did the best they could at any time, um, depending on the resources they had at hand and what they knew and how they felt at the time. And I think that mindset for everybody entering a retrospective is extremely important because it allows people to relax enough so that they can share the things, even the things that sometimes they're a bit embarrassed about it or they're a bit mad about it or they're a bit sad about it. And these things need to be shared as well in a team so that you can grow together. Because if you in a team can't talk about the things that are difficult, then it's very, very difficult to, to be alert of the things that you need to change over time. Maybe people are stuck in some part of the code. Maybe they're stuck with the technology and they should use another technology. It's, it's very important to have that communication. Do you have any tips or tricks to get into the mindset or are there any um, activities at the beginning of a retrospective which can help me get into this mindset? That's a very good question, Lisa. And if I really knew the answer to that, I'd be rich. But I can tell you what I normally do. And if it's an in real life retrospective, I often write Norm Kurth's prime directive on a poster and bring it to the retrospective and put it on the wall. And then I point to that when we start the retrospective, I say, remember the prime directive, everybody did the best they could. If it's an online retrospective, I sometimes put it in the email invitation, the calendar invitation, either the, the words of the prime directive or just remember that we're trying to find faults in the system, not in the individuals or something like that. I was um, recently um, involved in a little LinkedIn discussion about whether you could find faults in the system instead of in the people. Because what, what, we, what some people said there was that actually the system is made up of people and that's, that's definitely true. And also that sometimes some people do screw up and sometimes some people are evil and that's really true as well. And I, I, I appreciate that sometimes it is somebody's fault, but I think it's valuable at least to try to have that mindset that we are trying to figure out how can we improve the way that we communicate? How can we improve our processes? How can we improve the circumstances for the individuals so that they can be perform the best they can, both technically, but also as team players? So reminding people about the prime directive when the retrospective starts is one way of doing it. And sometimes you need to remind them also in the middle of the retrospective, okay, remember we are trying to figure out how to how to solve the whole system of people and not pointing at individuals. But it's difficult because we are brought up with that. We're brought up with our parents asking who started that fight, who broke that vase um, and my family, who left the milk out on the table from the breakfast, things like that. You mentioned a facilitator before who um, makes the agenda and so on. Um, do you think it's better to have one person in charge for every retrospective we do? Or do you think it's a good thing to, um, to uh, give the, uh, yeah, the, the glass around, so to say, um, to, to handle this um, facilitation person differently from each retrospective? Yeah, that's, that's also a very relevant question, Lisa, because a lot of people are struggling with exactly that. What I see in many um, companies using Agile and particularly Scrum is that it happens to be the Scrum Master who is facilitating the retrospectives and the, and the Scrum Master will be facilita facilitating all the retrospectives because the theory is that that is a part of their responsibility. I think that a part of the responsibility for a scrum master is to make sure that the retrospectives will happen on a regular basis. But I don't think it's a good idea to have the same person facilitate all the retrospectives for, for various reasons. If it's a scrum master who's always facilitating the retrospectives, then that person is playing two different roles of the retrospective. When you are a facilitator, as I said before, you're making the agenda for the retrospective. You have to be aware of the body language of the people, either in real life or if it's online like this, 
you have to be looking at them and see, do they want to say something? Do they, are they rolling their eyes because they think something is stupid? Are they angry about something? It's very important that the facilitator is looking at the body language to see whether we should stop this conversation or whether we should go in smaller groups instead of in plenum to have that conversation. And also, as I said before, the, um, the facilitator has the responsibility to move the discussions along so that we go through the retrospective and we, we gather the data, we generate insights, we decide what to do and we decide about the right thing to do and we focus on the right problems. And it all has to be done within that time box that you set aside for the retrospective, which is sometimes one and a half hour, sometimes two hours. That's a full-time job in a, in a retrospective. So if you are facilitating the retrospective, you don't really get anything out of it yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you say that the Scrum Master is part of the team, which I believe is the case, then the Scrum Master will never get anything out of the retrospective themselves because they're not part of the discussions, they're not part of the decision making because they're focused on being a facilitator. If on the other hand, they, they focus on being part of the team, so they go into the discussions, they spend time in the smaller breakout rooms and then they don't really have the possibility to also be aware of, of what's happening with the other people and being aware of time. When, like many years ago, when I was facilitating retrospectives for my own team, I would sometimes get lost in some of the discussions because they were very interesting for me because I was part of the team and then I would forget that I was facilitating the retrospective. So I believe that it can happen once in a while, but then the Scrum Master will just be the facilitator. So if you could, in a team, either, as you said, pass the glass around so that other team members would facilitate from time to time, or even that you, that Scrum Masters help each other facilitate retrospective so that sometimes you facilitate for another team and somebody else facilitates for your team, or you can have an external facilitator uh, to come in from outside and, and uh, facilitate retrospectives. I, I do that for some companies where I facilitate every or every other or a retrospective or a retrospective every three months. So, yeah. The short and answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very helpful because we do it on our team to pass the glass around. And um, I thought it is a good thing, but uh, I think we can improve the way we do our retrospectives. Um, 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 a question popped up in the chat room. Um, it's um, regarding your... Um, your story with the milk class and the finger pointing, the milk, uh, milk class, which was le left on the table in the kitchen. Um, can you add details about the impact of different cultural backgrounds on a retrospective? High context, low context, negative feedback habits, and so on. Yeah, there's a, there's, if I understand the question correct, the question is about um, how does different cultures um, like um, impact the retrospective? Yes. And, and different cultures have a huge impact on the retrospective, um, but also the other way around. I do believe that if what you can start in a retrospective of communication can spread out to the rest of at least the team's work and then sometimes perhaps also the organization. But it is, it is difficult to, um, it's difficult for a facilitator to facilitate somebody from a different culture than your own because you're not aware of the pitfalls that are there. And you might think that if people are happy and smiling and nodding, that's a very good sign because uh, it would be a good sign in Denmark because we would always complain. And I guess it's the same in Germany, right? You would be sure to complain. I mean, I, I mean that's, that's at least the German tourist story, right? Um, <laughs> but in other cultures, it is, it's more difficult for them to say something negative. Um, I, so what I do sometimes if I, if I facilitate retrospectives with different cultures is that I look at what can I do right now to help this problem. So if I cannot, if I cannot change the problem, if I cannot change their culture, the way they communicate, the way they feel, then I have to change the symptoms, right? And changing the symptoms means that I set up some sort of facilitation activities that does not allow them to fall into these bad habits. So for instance, if they're afraid of speaking up, then I make sure that we are either completely anonymous when they say something, when they have to say something bad, or I put them in smaller groups so that they don't have to say something in plenum. That sometimes helps that. 
if they're from a culture where it's about finding the culprit and blaming that and getting this person fired or sacked, I spend a lot of time on the Prime Directive in the beginning to explain why it's helpful for everybody, not just to find the one person who is guilty, but to figure out how can we create an environment that uh, prevents this mistakes or this failure from happening again, instead of just telling off the person. And I would also be very aware as a facilitator of what things came out and what how people communicated with each other. So I would I would probably, as I said before, I'll probably do less in plenum and more in smaller groups. So at least it wouldn't affect that many people at a time. And I would make sure that if something comes up on a post-it note that's really negative, I would actually just throw that one away and then talk to people again. But also sometimes measuring safety can be a good idea. Uh, there's a lot of ways of measuring safety out there. One could be just ask them anonymously on a scale from one to five, how safe do you feel talking about things in this team, in this group? And then if you see that most people are not safe to say anything, then that's probably something you should work with. But as I said before, you need to figure out, can I change the problem or can I just help out the symptoms? And sometimes with a huge cultural difference, you can't change the problem. You just have to work around the symptoms. But sometimes if it's just within an organization, then perhaps you can look at how can we build more psychological safety in this team? How can we change the organizational culture to accept that um, people can say things that have gone wrong without being fired or without being ridiculed or without having their bonus taken away from them. And that could be, but that's a whole other issue about creating trust and psychological safety. Do you always, uh, do you also use these uh, safety methods for um, let's say European teams when they don't feel safe within their company? Yeah, I do that as well. Definitely. It's, it's not just different cultures naturally, uh, nationally, there's also different cultures in companies. And for instance, if, I find a huge general difference between small startup companies and big uh, enterprise companies. So with big enterprise companies, they, they tend to have this uh, sort of, um, I would say almost masculine culture where we are having hierarchies and there are like rule sets. And, and if you say something stupid or you do something stupid, you're ridiculed and it's embarrassing. And the managers never doesn't do anything wrong. They're just like up here and always perfect. And there I have to really work hard on, uh, on that culture and try to make them work on the culture also outside the retrospectives, because there's only a limit to how much you can change in the retrospective. You can only change the people who are there. Um, you can't change people outside the retrospective. So, but in startup companies, for instance, that normally, uh, again, in general, the culture is normally different because in a startup, you have to make a lot of mistakes And it's, it's a part of the innovation process. So they're more used to making mistakes and they're more used to making, to using mistakes as a learning tool instead of using mistakes as a blaming tool, if you know what I mean. I, I do know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I have another question reg regarding myself. What would be the worst thing to do in a retrospective? I think the worst thing to do in a retrospective would be to laugh out loud at somebody else's pain. Have yeah. you, have you, uh, have you um, experienced that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've, yeah, I think, I've, okay. I think I've tried everything terrible in a retrospective and, and definitely the laughing is a problem. Um, but even with laughing, you can learn something from that. If somebody is laughing at somebody else who's made a mistake or who, who's feeling bad about it, Uh, then I think you should immediately um, make a timeout, stop the retrospective or change the setting you're in to, to uh, safeguard the person who's being ridiculed. Of course, some people like that other people laugh at them. It's like, it's like the bantering that they have in that team, but you can tell, well, that's something that is painful. And the, the reason why people laugh at that is also a very telltale sign about the culture and about perhaps what they're afraid of themselves, because some people use laughter as um, as a tension remover so if they're worried um, about talking about failures and they start laughing at that it's not necessarily because they're evil people and and they want to ridicule that person it could also be that they just feel very uncomfortable with failure and talking about controversial things 
And in that case, it, it gives you it gives you knowledge about the person who laughed, not necessarily that they're a bad person. I mean, they could be a bad person. I, I wouldn't know that. It's, but sometimes it's it's also an interesting gift that you get more information about that person. But you should, of course, try not to laugh at people who are in pain. Yeah, I, I won't do it, I hope. <laughs> I don't but... think you would ever do that, Lisa. <laughs> Um, how do you identify if the person who laughs is bad or just uncomfortable with the situation? Do you have any key well, stuff which can be identified? Yeah, it, so I would say that I really try to live um, after the prime directive myself. So I would, if somebody laughed, always try to explain it as he or she is being uncomfortable instead of explaining it as he or she is being evil and stupid. So I would always at first hand try to interpret it as um, a weakness they're showing or that they're uncomfortable. And then I guess if, if it continues to be like that and you see that it's a trend, then maybe you need to talk to that person. And I think that for a lot of different personality types that can be negative in the retrospective, like the loud mouth who's saying too much or the silent one who's never saying anything or the negative one who's being very critical or laughing at other people. I think it's important to remember that you cannot solve that in the group of people. They will, you don't want people to lose face. You don't want to point at them and say, You're, you are wrong. You want to talk to them one-on-one -on -one between the retrospectives and say, well, this behavior that you're showing, it's uh, unfortunate. It has this effect on other people. Uh, so is there... A, Is there a, could, could you change that in some way? And then sometimes the loud mouth, the people who are talking all the time will say, yes, of course, I don't have to talk all the time. I was just trying to help you uh, solve all the problems. Or the negative one sometimes is not aware that they're negative. They just think that they are the critical voice. And um, Linda Rising, who is being interviewed after this, uh, wrote this book, Patterns for Fearless Change. And one of her patterns is the champion skeptic. And the champion skeptic basically is that you take somebody who's very uh, negative or critical towards something, and then you make them your champion skeptic. So you go to them between the retrospectives and you say, I've noticed that you're very good at being critical to things. So perhaps you can help me um, creating or planning retrospectives that work well for this team, because I've noticed that you're, you're laughing at me or you're laughing at the activities And perhaps you can help me plan the next retrospective so that we can do it in a way that works. And if you show people that respect that they might be able to help you, then they can be part of your journey. They can be your champion. And some of the most negative people I've had at retrospectives have become the most wonderful champion skeptics afterwards and have been talking about retrospectives as one of the best things since sliced bread. But you cannot do it in plenum. You have to do it one-on-one -on -one and you have to show them respect instead of saying you're an idiot, which you sometimes maybe want to say. You have to acknowledge that they just have another way of reacting to things than you have. Um, you, you mentioned some activities and retrospectives. Do you have a favorite activity to um, do in ret ret retrospectives? Yeah, I do. I, yes, I do. Well, I have different favorite activities for different settings. But let me give you two. Uh, my absolute favorite for, um, for just heartbeat retrospectives is the timeline where I just, I draw a line on the board or I have a timeline in an online document and then people should, uh, they have a like five to 10 minutes to gather data, brainstorm on things that went well, things that didn't go so well, and then things that are in between or questions. And The reason why I like the timeline is because it's a very open general retrospective. It's not about um, the process or the, the learning or the test. That can also be good for some retrospectives, but sometimes I like this just open, let's just lift the carpet and see what's beneath. And I like the way that it uses colors because it allows people to stand away and sort of squint with the eyes and just look at, is this mostly positive or negative? I'm aware that some people are colorblind, but if you tell them which one is green and which one is red, they can normally tell the difference in general afterwards. So that's the timeline is uh, one of my favorites, but another one which is a favorite is um, the circles and soup or the circles of influence. Um, and the circles and soup or the circles of influence are, are basically that you just 
you draw uh, three circles. I'm just going to do it. You draw three circles here, or actually two. And uh, oh. <laughs> there, oh, there, yeah. 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 Uh, almost, well, it, it won't work. Anyway, you draw two circles. And in the innermost circle, these are the things that the team can do something about. And then the next circle are the things that they can influence. And outside is the soup. And then sometimes when they have gathered data on a timeline, I notice that a lot of the things that they think are problems are actually somebody else's problem. It's not something they can do something about. And then I say, let's try the soup exercise. And I draw these circles on the whiteboard next to, or I have another online document that I can pull in. And then I say, let's take um, the problems that you have and put them into these circles of influence. And then we can look at how many you think you could do something about, how many you can influence and how many are in the soup. And that gives them the picture. It's like holding up a mirror to them and saying what you think, what you see. And then sometimes some teams have, have gotten into the culture of just blaming other people, people outside the team. And most of what they are complaining about is in the soup. And that can be an interesting thing for the team to look at. That self-reflection can be really powerful. Okay, look at this. So most of the stuff that you don't like is somebody else's problem. It's not something you can do anything about. Could we perhaps in this retrospective focus on the things that we can do something about? I appreciate that there are some things that really annoys people and they need to vent about it, but maybe they just need to vent about it at every third retrospective, maybe not every time. And maybe they just have to accept that there are some things that they cannot change and say, well, these, this is irritating, but we can't change it. And we need to adapt the way that we work around it. As I said before, there's some problems you can solve and then there's some problems you can't solve. And then perhaps if you have decided that you can't solve it, you just have to work around the symptoms instead. Um, we only have uh, three minutes left. So um, I would like to hear um, from you how to get more advantages from retrospective as an individual. So how can I get more advantages and how ca can the um, project benefit more from the retrospectives? Yeah, I think that one thing that's very important is that you hear from everybody in a retrospective. And if you have somebody who's very shy or for some reason are very quiet, you need to figure out how can you get the information out of their heads. You probably know that when you ask a question in plenum, some people will answer immediately and some people will not. But it is very important to hear from the people who are not answering. So if you yourself are shy, maybe you should tell the facilitator, could we have some activities that enables me to just write on post-it notes or that enables me to talk in smaller groups, maybe only two and two. Um, and then my partner or the other people in the group can feed back to the plenum discussion because it's difficult for me to say something. Uh, so you're, you have a responsibility, I think, to try to understand yourself and help the facilitator get the most out of you because people in general, um, are, they have got like, there's two different overarching types of brains. There's the reflective brain and the active brain. And for the ones who are reflective, they need to think about things on their own before they blurt out with an answer. And then we have the active thinkers who are just, uh, they can't think unless they're talking. You probably know a few of those. And, and they, they seem to just start talking immediately when they have a problem. And then they just talk through it or do something about it. And then it seems like they're the only ones with the answers if you ask in plenum. But if you allow other people the time to think, and that's why one of the reasons why I like the timeline where they're sitting silently and writing on post-it notes on their own individually before we start talking about it together. Thank you very much uh, for your retrospective introduction and for the tips and tricks. Um, the next interview is with Eberhard and Linda Rising. Um, it starts in six minutes from now on and it's about fearless change. So thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, Lisa.